Okay. Yes, and our Las Angeles. Yes. Go hey, here. Yeah. Let's go there. Or let's go right. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's so good to be here in Lula. Uh, uh, Alex, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, if you can uh, remove, uh, hide, hide this one. And also okay. press on three, more. And hide. Uh, hide. Yeah, this one. Yes, that's it. So now we are. Okay, now we're ready to go. Oh, we got there in the end. So I'm Alexander Serb from the University of Edinburgh. A uh, reader in unconventional AI hardware. I do quite a bit of work on uh, stuff that's very directly related to what we're doing here, but for uh, commercial reasons, I'm not allowed to say much. However, I do think that I have an interesting topic, which is out in the public domain that I can talk about. It's a bit out there, uh, hardware oriented, but I do hope you find it, uh, you find it nice, you find it interesting and stimulating. It's all about low energy and this concept of adiabatic computing and specifically the instantiation that we are pursuing in Edinburgh. So I'll talk a little bit about who we are uh, in case you know you think of any connections that could be made. So I'm a member of the Center for Electronics Frontiers, which is quite a large group. I think we are 40 now, 40 people is quite a large group. Our mission statement is simple, push the frontiers of electronics to innovating, emerging non-electronic technologies. So there is a foundation of nanoelectronics and restive devices, in fact. Uh, we work on metal oxides specifically, for those of you interested in specifics. But there are three basic pillars of what we do. Some stuff with energy storage and batteries, etc. Some stuff, uh, actually quite a lot of, on uh, nanobio devices and implants and things like that and novel AI hardware, which is sort of my division, as it were. So what does that mean in practice? What does my life look like? Designing chips, basically, when I'm not feeling paperwork, at least. And what you can see on the left is an example of a gigantic reticle consisting of multiple chips that we have put through uh, through one of our major projects. I believe this one is the, if it's, we call it an engineering run because the whole wafer belongs to us, as you can see. You can see the reticle pattern repeated over and over and that is literally just our designs. Every little rectangle or square on the screen represents a chip design and the colors represent the three institutions that contributed to them, University of Edinburgh, University of Manchester and uh, Imperial London. So I'm not going to go, of course, through all of those, but basically this is what we do. We design stuff, schematics, etc. We do our simulations. Eventually the time comes to put it into a layout. This layout format gets flattened and then sent off to a foundry to be manufactured. And this is what we get back to then start testing. So I'm going to expand a little bit more than uh, the previous speakers on the hardware perspective, which I hope you'll find interesting. And I begin by that rather rhetorical question up there, does AI have a hardware problem? Of course it does, we all know it. But the interesting thing is that in this particular case, you see that being clocked from 2018, or as, uh, as, as I call it, year four before GPT, BG. So, since then, of course, we've had a massive change. GPT, GPT burns millions every day just to run and reading between the lines and what Sam Altman is saying, etc. It took somewhere around $200 million to, to train. That's my best estimate. So we really need to do something about that. Next, I would turn our attention to this report from the International Energy Agency, which says that data centers and data transmission networks are responsible for nearly 1% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, energy related. So that's stuff coming out of power plants, of course. This depends where your data center is and whether you're powering it with coal or with wind power. But still, the numbers are staggering. In fact, yesterday when I was at the, um, in, in city center in Lula, uh, the data we, European data week, we had a guy from Ireland who said that 20% of their country's energy goes into data centers. That is quite staggering. 
was something that we usually think of as, you know, free, just go to the computer, type in a few words, out comes the answer. Well, the final headline I chose for this slide is perhaps rather esoteric, but it says that rising energy costs erode competitive edge of collocation data center operation operators. And what this practically means is that, according to this article, more than half of the British participants in the study said that their electricity costs were between 10 and 30 percent of their OPEX operating expenses, with a quarter of them saying they are paying well over that amount. That's money not going into R&D, that's money not going into uh, salaries. So it is something that significantly impacts the bottom line of data operators, large data operators. And if we take a higher level look, we see that it hardly gets any better, whether it be a number of internet users, internet traffic, data center workloads, the numbers are actually frightening. The appetite of the world for data is simply insatiable. And of course, if you are afraid of heights, don't look at the crypto. Now, both speakers before touched upon Moore's law, so I am going to say a few words about it as well. It's been a staple of our industry, of electronics industry for decades. And in its sort of original form, what Gordon Moore said was, was that every couple of years or so, the number of computing elements transistors on, on, a, on a chip on a system will double. Um, there are slight variations. Some people say the density of chips, et cetera, but I believe to the best of my knowledge, the original formulation is about fewer numbers. Even if the chip becomes the size of a blanket, of course, then we get into yields issues and all of that, which we're going to cover. But you can see that this has been plowing through rather nicely, chugging along for quite a few decades. And there is considerable debate in the industry whether has it stopped, has it not stopped, when is the limit, et cetera. Uh, but I think we can all agree that from about 2012, 13, and uh, in terms of CMOS technology, from uh, from the point when we started going FinFET, really, something is clearly not quite right. Again, for the interest, since there's, there's more of a hardware audience than I expected, I will just uh, say that Moore's law can expand because of the specific definition in multiple ways. And one of those, and perhaps the most exciting, development in the industry at the moment is advanced packaging, where you have multiple chips going into a silicon interposer. So instead of putting it on a PCB, you put it on an actual interposer made with the same technology as the chip, and then you just stack uh, multiple of those and tile them. So it's like you have two wafers that have through silicon vias, which allow you to stack chips underneath. And this technology is really making a big difference with the um, kind of limitation seeming to to become increasingly the thermal management because if you put more compute now in a three-dimensional space rather than spreading it out like we used to do eventually you reach power densities that you would find inside perhaps a nuclear reactor or a rocket engine the numbers are frightening but either way that is where we are so there are a number of ways to try and move beyond that to attack the problem and continue getting more and more computation. Uh, this, of course, can not possibly do justice to the absolutely staggering amount of effort, manpower, well, certain months, if you want to say, uh, and, and money going into the system. It's, it's really, really big business. But I will just point <coughs> out that very roughly speaking, for, for the purposes of our discussion, we can say that there is a first line of attack, which is streamlining data flows usually tested on the PGA, sometimes it gets on to ASICs, et cetera. But a very good example uh, is that of systolic arrays where you just feed the data in an array of processing elements and then you churn it like a sausage making machine. Basically, the data naturally flows through the system and out comes the finished, uh, finished sausage, as I said, finished data. But that is basically uh, the idea to, to shape your hardware so that it is aware of the flows of, of data. Second line of attack is uh, within memory computing. We've had some hints of that. I do think that's big. So we're working in the right area, especially vector matrix multiplication acceleration. So we're talking about distributed memory systems like this, where you have uh, memory 
next to a fabric of CPUs connected by uh, a luxuriant fabric of, um, of interconnect, or indeed RAM and restore-based, if you prefer, crossbar arrays, uh, and so on. All of these are hugely important. We have to pursue all of these avenues if we want to continue getting power. I didn't put it, a uh, computational power, that is, uh, and without, you know, destroying the planet in the process. I didn't put it in the slides, but an interesting thing was that if you go to the IEA, International en uh, Energy Agency, uh, website and look at the slide on computation, you may have heard things like uh, what I said, that 2% of global power consumption is, goes to data centers, etc. If you look a bit more deeply into the numbers, they tell an interesting story that we have, we have a voracious appetite for computation, and then we have an absolutely ferocious battle to try and keep this under control with hardware engineers really pushing down the costs and everything. So this 2%, thankfully, has stayed reasonably stable for the best part of the last decade, at least. The question is for how much longer. If we fail in any of these fronts, then we'll see that the data will dominate the trend, and then we are royally screwed. Anyhow, the important thing here is that still X amount of data needs to be processed, and that leads us, leads us down a lot of interesting philosophical paths of discussion and so on about how many bits do you need to represent certain numbers of states and how many combinations there are, how many functions there are, and all of these things. But the matter of fact remains that we have to move still certain amounts of data uh, between memory, processing, and, and then we can do stuff to it, basically which to me looks like this game, Klotsky, We're basically trying to, to move about within the boundaries, the constraints of that X amount of data and, and get basically uh, the result that you want out of it by doing gymnastics, which again is very important, has to be done. But like everything, we need to throw even more resources to the problem. So finally, after that very long introduction, we get to adiabatic computing, which I put as counting charge buckets or counting beans, if you prefer, different analogy. Very briefly, to my understanding, as a hardware person, the picture on the left is what the abstract so the data scientist, computational neuroscientist, et cetera, sees. The good old neuron that we all know and love inputs, weights, weighted sounds, activation functions, and perhaps bells and whistles and more fancy stuff, but you have basically some mathematics chugging along under the bonnet. Then on the right-hand side is what the hardware engineer will see. So in this hydraulic analogy, you have the battery, which is a big tank of water. Water represents the charge, and then you distribute that to capacitors, to load capacitors, uh, which you are represented as buckets. You do your computation. The valves are controlled uh, conditionally by what's happening, which buckets are full or empty. You do your computation, you dump the charge, and then, hey-ho, we go again. To elaborate a bit more on this, I shall attempt to play a video, which will explain it in very simple terms. Let's see if it works. Uh, okay, so we do not have... Uh, um, audio, but that's okay. It basically tells you standard introduction, artificial intelligence is everywhere and gives you standard sort of patterns of where this is going to be used. And it makes basically the point from before that it's becoming more and more uh, taxing on the energy infrastructure of the world. So we have this project called ACON and we use uh, this analogy to explain exactly what we do. You can see the buckets happily turning around over there. Of course, we have to already charge the battery every so often, and that's how we consume. What Moore's law is doing is that the buckets become smaller, but it also becomes harder to build them reliably. They become leakier, which has been alluded to in static power dissipation. So we move to the adiabatic technique where we use the inductor in order to recycle the charge. This is what we call charge recovery computing. It just chugs back and forth like the tide going in and going out. 
Of course, in reality, nothing is perfect. Perhaps if you supercool it, which is why cryo is very interesting to us, uh, you can get uh, less friction in the system, as it were, but you would still need to introduce some energy to the system to keep it going. But we are still looking mm -hmm. at uh, quite impressive numbers, at least in simulations so far, of, um, of performance. This has been tried before in the 90s with no much success on processors, but that is because it was pre-neural network world. And that is quite an important point. Neurons allow you to do massively parallel computation, which means that when you send a tide out, you service an enormous amount of computational fabric rather than stuffing everything onto a, a microprocessor. So that is, that is a complete game changer. And it is what makes this technology uh, essentially work, what it makes it tick. And of course, all of the sort of conclusion of the sales pitch is that we have a, a better energy performance and that is important for sustainability, etc. So let us look at what the technology can actually do from how far we have progressed it. Ideally suited for artificial neural networks, number one point that parallelism is really paramount in terms of actual performance. Uh, academic duty of care says that I shouldn't claim more than that until we have actually put it on silicon, but in simulation we get far better power reduction than that. But hardware person, I'll see it, I'll read of it when I see it on chip. Uh, power reduction versus like-for-like -like, non-adiabatic circuit, and this is the only graph I promise of data and stuff that I'm going to show. So to walk very quickly through it, we have the CMOS part, standard CMOS non-adiabatic, which follows the white lines. On the x-axis, we have the number of uh, synapses. And of course, the larger the tree, the more synapses that service an artificial neuron, the more efficient it becomes because it's the synapses that we've turned into antibiotic circuits. What you see at the bottom is effectively the static power dissipation on the dashed line that is no input. So that's the leakage. Uh, it's kind of uh, leakage. So synapse energy is per operation, and that is in picogels. So it gets just about one picojoule when you have 1,024 bits. That's when you're doing nothing. When you're pushing stuff, when you're pushing data around, you're gradually creeping towards that solid line. And then this is where very interesting interactions happen with neural network design, etc. because your sparsity, if you can get it very sparse, you can ride close to the bottom line. If you cannot, you're moving inexorably up towards the solid line. The purple, and uh, reddish sort of traces are for different versions of adiabatic systems, different configurations, hugely suboptimal. These were very early results. Uh, and what I can't disclose, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, but you can see that you have a baseline, which we are trying to push down by making the adiabatic system more efficient. And there are ways of doing that, so that's why your baseline is quite bad uh, by comparison. But, you see that the scaling is much better when you start actually loading the system. And you can get some pretty impressive uh, power dissipation advantages. If you uh, pair this system with the right sort of neural network implementation and, uh, and implement it nicely in hardware and actually bother to optimize it. For the hardware people, this means that if we get the 90%, just the 90% uh, reduction in power, it makes 180 nanometer CMOS looks like, look like 65 nanometers. Mm -hmm. In terms of overall power dissipation, the area will be another matter, I have to, to admit. But anyone who has designed CMOS will tell you that as the number of nanometers gets, uh, gets smaller, um, the design rule handbook increases proportionally. So you have thousands and thousands of pages of design rules when you are designing in more aggressive technology nodes. Also, there is a huge difference in cost per square millimeter uh, for these technologies. We are currently working on a proof of concept demonstrator in 180. Um, that's what allows us in terms of cost to do this on wafer scale. And a few open questions are how well do these techniques downscale to 22 nanometers and below, especially when we get to FinFETs. Nothing tells us that this should stop working below. Although, taking a segue from the previous uh, speakers, the balance 
and the and the um, ratio between full load and no load will change because as things get smaller, they leak more. So again, it's very it's going to be very interesting to see what uh, what the actual numbers will tell us. Now the question is what the actual saving in a full size ANN. So we are building some applications around vision to to actually answer that question. So let us connect this a little bit to VSAs. What are the implications? The interesting thing is that, is that parallelism with the neural fabric. It's a potentially strong argument for implementing VSAs on neural hardware. I remember back in 2017, 18, 18 when I met Chris Elias Smith, I was thinking, why do you bother with neural hardware? Just put it in a GPU or something like that. But if indeed it turns out that because of the parallelism, we can get that kind of saving, that in my view would be a game changer and possibly enough to entice the industry to change the way they actually compute. So as I was saying, possible way to do this is by using things like a neural engineering framework or perhaps a clinically cleaned version of NEF where we don't care too much about being biorealistic we take only the bits we are interested in so that we can represent symbols through ensemble encoding, that, that kind of stuff. Not necessarily uh, attainable, preferable for any and all computational loads. I would not make a pocket calculator out of that, but I think it still has the chance of being broadly enough applicable to make an impact. <clears throat> And that's again with other hardware that we're doing that. Unfortunately, it's killing me, but I can't talk about uh, hopefully next year. So because I, these are some slides that were recycled for when I was uh, reporting to the British authorities. That explains the title, but where are we? We are looking at two engineering runs and we are, we're basically pretty much submitted the first one and we are moving towards the second where we'll have a sort of mid-scale demonstrator. So do watch this space if it seems interesting. Next summer, we should be able to have hopefully some interesting results, possibly even from the second one, if nothing goes wrong. With that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. Feel free to take a snapshot of my business card slide. And as, as always, if anything, any of this sounds interesting, talk to me. That's it. Yeah. Thank you, Alexander. We have a few minutes for questions. Yes. I have a question. Awesome talk, by the way. Uh, really interesting stuff. So I have many questions for you, and I'll, I'll take off why. Uh, but I did want to know directly, kind of, um, the AI architectures that you're building on top of this. Are they all directly related to VSA? Is it strictly VSA or is it HPC, HRR? Can, can you eliminate that? It's a lower level of abstraction. So we are looking at things like fully connected layers, mm -hmm. convolutional layers, that level. What seems to be the most important factor in determining how well this will work is literally the convergence and the divergence of fan in and fan out of your neurons. So the higher you can get those, which is true for any memory, in fact. That's why people prefer larger arrays because you amortize the peripherals up to a certain point. And then we're getting into details about load capacitances and the like. But the fan in and the fan out are, I'm not going to say the only, but probably by far the dominant factors. And then you can map literally anything you like from this. There's something like a graph architecture for symbolic reasons. You can do that... some graph stuff. Okay. Which is part of Sorry about that. Yes. Not even to us in this uh, small intimate community. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but uh, we um, keep going. I guess our, you, you have a just, you, you fan in and fan out because I'm totally not a hardware person. Which is better from your point of view, low fan in or? I, 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 I can because if I have a big heavy driver which does a lot of logic behind to drive a line, I don't want it to go through this whole brouhaha and fanfare. And then here you go, I switch the transistor. You want something more grand to happen on the line. Thank you. So um, you're probably going to say you can't talk about it, but um, <laughs> is is the some of the power cycling like 
I imagine it has to do with the the connection of the ground. So is it like, are you guys working with um, like, you know, a different, a totally different stack, like developing your own um, technology in terms of metal gears? Wonderful question. And I can actually talk about that. Uh, the beautiful thing about this, uh, that's why I can't talk about it, is that it is a, des a circuit design technique. You can build it on any chip available, literally anything. The difference is that uh, for the adiabatic parts, okay, okay, you'll have a system and you'll have an adiabatic part, and for functional reasons, you'll have an adiabatic that works um, like a regular chip. So the, what distinguishes the adiabatic part is that instead of feeding it from a VDD, from a power supply, and then dumping into ground, this is sinusoidal. Got it. So this is, you can, uh, it's compatible with different uh, fabrications that I imagine. Absolutely. Okay. Very cool. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Fine. Uh, all right. Uh,